I welcome now Professor Krishnan that will co-chair with me the remaining part of this meeting. Uh, Krishnan is the president of the International Federation of Medical and Biological Engineering, IFMB, which is our uh, mothership as Yambes. And uh, Krishnan, as uh, you would never say, but more than 35 years of experience in the domain of biomedical engineering, has been working over four continents so far, educating students as a consultant, as an expert for uh, manufacturers, but also for ministries of health all over the world. Krishnan, thank you for accepting this invitation. The floor is yours now for uh, continuing this session, and probably you may have a few questions for our panelists and Adriana, first of all. Thank you, Krishna. Well, uh, Professor Pikia, it is indeed my pleasure and honor to be here. I'm delighted to say that uh, I had the pleasure of uh, attending the two previous sessions. You know, and I'm glad our friend, the Timo Hamsa showed the picture and I see that I'm there, except, you know, it is a few years ago and we mm. need to start working on anti-aging like most of the panelists are. I'm going in the other direction. But anyway, uh, uh, I must thank uh, uh, Dr. Adriana Velasquez for this fantastic presentation. She's been doing uh, fabulous work. Uh, is she still here? I have a question for her. Uh, oh, I must thank you for not only the presentation, the fabulous work, you know, and we do this World Medical Devices, Global Medical Devices Forum, and uh, we are very happy to participate. And, you know, you are spearheading this important initiative. These publications are excellent. You know, I, I, I hope people make use of all this. I just have a simple, I mean, you'd covered so many things, you know, it, it, I think for, uh, I must also say that I particularly enjoyed this uh, presentation by the distinguished member of the uh, parliament. You know, uh, his, his talk was excellent. I think uh, I need to digest it. It takes more time. After I have breakfast, I can digest better. My neurons will work better. So, uh, Dr. Adriana Velasquez, uh, the global pandemic highlighted many of the shortcomings of the health systems across the world. Whoever expected this, right? What lessons can we learn from these last couple of years, which are not the great years, on integrating advanced technologies and new approaches to strengthen our hand in future crises? If we can just comment briefly on that, I'll appreciate Thank you, Thank you Professor Shankar. And, 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 and really, it, it's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, uh, thank you for the question. So. Um, well, actually, what it really shows are the, that the, the most basic essential tools need to be available absolutely everywhere. And one of them was personal protective equipment. The second one is oxygen. Everybody takes for granted oxygen, and oxygen was a huge need. And uh, maybe you remember that I've been saying about the need for oxygen for pneumonia and detection for pneumonia for long years. This, 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 this pandemic really shows us that those basic things need to be available absolutely everywhere. But it also raised the issue of the need of biomedical engineers, which it is very bad that we have to have a crisis to be recognized. But yes, they recognized that the medicines could not save the persons. Uh, it was, we needed to save healthcare workers through protective equipment, but we needed to save patients through ventilators, ICU, and also have either even even computer aided diagnostics to diagnose for the for the radiologists for their words no so i think bringing innovative technologies that could be more affordable and easier to use and good maintenance it's really a game changer and we look forward to having many more innovations really to address the needs of the uh, people that are in the low resource settings but uh, look, looking forward to working with all of you uh, Thanks very much for the excellent response. Uh, Dr. Professor Pekia, you have a question for, for... Adriana, thank you so much. You mentioned a medical device, you mentioned it personal protective equipment. Uh, but what about the data? We saw with this pandemic that data sharing is really crucial in order to increase our preparedness, learn lessons to better in future, respond better. What you would like to say to Mr. Sokol, to the European Parliament, to the, to the European Commission about the importance of data in healthcare? Uh, thank you, thank you, Prof Professor Petia. It is absolutely indispensable because we couldn't even know 
what was missing because uh, there was there was not enough information. So how many do you need of X or Y devices? Well, the facility assessments were not there. Their inventories were done in different systems. And that is why we talk about the nomenclature and the harmonization. We need systems that could bring us the data and the information to make better decisions and to make sure that where, where are the needs and how can we uh, better um, fill the gaps. But we didn't have enough information. How many equipment are working? How many are needed? Uh, where do we need them? If they're functioning or not, how much do they cost? Prices, prices are totally unknown. Uh, the issue about uh, the, the, the beginning of the crisis, we didn't, didn't even have uh, manufacturers to supply information. And they said, well, how many you need of this or that? And we just estimated. And that was the big issue. Right now, for even for oxygen, oxygen supply, and everything related to ventilators. And so we're asking, please give us number, please give us information. So I think data and information is absolutely essential to, to drive the, a, a good response, a good preparedness for everything. Data also on the use of the devices and the use of the PPE. Are they either reaching the last mile? Because there was a lot of procurement done, and you remember those things. But is it really meeting the needs of the users or not? So yes, um, Leandro, I totally agree. Uh, data is indispensable. And one core element of this data is that nomenclature that will help us uh, at least put a single way of um, uh, addressing uh, all types of medical devices. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adriano. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Krishnan, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Thanks very much for your, uh, you know, Continue your fantastic work and we give you all the support. So we now uh, go on to the panel discussion. We have a series of uh, excellent speakers. Uh, we start with uh, uh, Professor Maria Teresa Arandolo. Uh, she is the first female electrical engineer at the Universidad Nacional de Tucumán, Argentina, later founder of the Argentinian Society of biomedical engineering. She's the first female to become full professor of telecommunication and bioengineering in Spain. Professor at bioengineering and photonics department at Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, uh, UPM, and the director of the Latin American Affairs at UPM and the director of Vodafone chair for healthcare and e-inclusion since 2002. And I've had the pleasure of listening to Professor Maria Teresa in several countries. <laughs> She's always giving a really exciting talk. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts on this topic, Professor Maria Teresa. Thank you very much indeed, dear Krishnan. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to share our thought regarding how should be the investment for the citizen of the future in this new world. Thank you to Mr. Sokol from the European Parliament for helping us to support these uh, making decisions in order to implement the procedures for the healthcare uh, technology acquisition. Uh, I have to say that uh, we are uh, trying to support the investment of uh, the, for the citizen of the future. I don't know what happens with my screen, but uh, because we are facing a new era, a new era that uh, should stimulate our research. And I can say that uh, our biomedical engineers are ready to afford this challenge, which is this challenge. We have a historical uh, challenge in order to produce the impact on the city of the future and on the citizen of the future, which means that we have to support the hospital of the future, the future of the healthcare, and the treatment of the future. And what is this about? The city of the future is composed but should be and will be composed by smart and friendly environments we, which will try to establish an intergenerational connection 
in these uh, sustainable spaces for the citizens of the future, which uh, in which we have to deploy the assistance and the health services by, based in the technologies we have been mentioned during all these uh, uh, these presentations previous to, to me. And uh, we have to implement the public health care for the future, based mainly in the decision making based on the evidence and data with better information for and with the citizen. And in this, in this context, this paradigm should implement the treatment for the future in which the smart system are supporting us for making personalized decisions, optimizing the management and the empowerment of the patient. In the context of this, of this uh, general paradigm, the hospital of the future, that should be mainly ubiquitous, ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous service for all the citizens, we will integrate the next generation technologies, the data and artificial intelligence, and we have to optimize these information flows between the patient and the healthcare world. And uh, all of this should be based in some kind of uh, digital technologies and data, such as artificial intelligence, cloud computing, the mobile health, all the wearables that will support the telemedicine services. And to do that, we have to use these uh, tools given by the artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things paradigm, the robotics, the big data, and the 5G to reduce the variability of the, of the results and to improve them in order to produce a real impact in the society. This is impossible to, to be done without the involvement of the decision makers in the management of healthcare and mainly of the purchase of the technology. And this is the reason why in this, in this talk, I would like to push the concept of the investment in digital technologies, in the new technologies, in order to provide a better health service. And um, what is the healthcare in this uh, hyper-connected, a new hyper-connected society? This should be something like humanized technology, because in the, in the last years, we have been living in this pandemic in which we know that we have to have an integrative philosophy in the healthcare centered in the personal health ecosystem, providing a positive and smart health in the context of this humanized technology. Based in six design principles, which are the interoperability, the virtualization, decentralization, real-time capability, service-oriented, and modularity of the services. And all of these concepts should be around digital technologies like uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence, high-performance network for remote hospital assistance, and supporting the digital transformation in this healthcare process, the interoperability, the platforms and data spaces, the ubiquitous hospital, which is a very, very new concept and supported by, as uh, the previous person talked about, the smart pharmacy and uh, uh, concepts like an uh, integrated robotics to provide the services, the operating room, room of the future with robots, augmented reality and proactive intelligent controls to provide this ubiquitous personal healthcare space. And uh, all of this is based in concepts like uh, a data center, a cloud of services, a new modular hospital, a new space that is all around you, all around the user, and basically a new way of thinking. And this wants to be some pioneers ideas for a better world. I have to say that the biomedical engineers in Europe are prepared to open 
the hands for this new work. And we trust, we trust in all the actions previously given by uh, Dr. Sokol in his presentation regarding the involvement of the European Parliament to implement procedures for this healthcare technology uh, acquisition to support this uh, new regulatory framework to make easier this implementation, to implement all these process, procedures. So everything is in our hands. Everything is in your hands. Let us work for a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maria Teresa, for this fantastic presentation. You know, you have been the first female engineer and accomplished so much. And I think you will be a great role model for all the future biomedical engineers, not only in Europe and Latin America, but all over the world. So keep continuing your work. I know you have also been doing a lot of work in assessment of Parkinson's disease and cognitive rehabilitation of stroke patients, remote ma management of diabetic patients and mental care, which is very important, which became after the COVID crisis. Uh, the city of the future and the hospital of the future, it is really good for biomedical engineers to start thinking big. You know, we, we talk about all these modules they cover in education, but th it is good to think about the ubiquitous hospital. And these ideas, I think with the young innovators, which the distinguished member of the parliament also talked and you referred to, you know, fit in very well with the frame. I have a question for you. I mean, particularly with respect to telemedicine, you know, you talked about IOT and IOMT and so on. So telemedicine has been around for many years, you know, however, just now during the pandemic, it seems like this got highlighted and got greater importance. And it also, you have been working in remote healthcare, but now people, everybody understands what is telemedicine, teleconsulting. You know? So uh, how do you foresee the evolution of this field and what role do you see for biomedical engineers at the present and future? Thank you very much for your words and for your comments. Dear Krishna. Okay, um, I face, uh, I think that is a reality that telemedicine now is, uh, is, uh, is a new tool in order to be communicated and this will not go back to the past, you know, so the progress of telemedicine is very clear. And then I envisage a very special field in which a telemedicine is a is a big and huge and great support. And it is in the field of uh, mental health. You know, during the pandemic, we have been asked for different actors in different countries regarding the support of the, uh, of the uh, medical actors in this pandemic, which were strongly affected by this uh, uh, problem and also by the suffering of all the people that were affected by this uh, disease. So um, we have been trying to implement services of supporting uh, uh, the mental health of the people that were involved in that. And this was proven to be extremely efficient in support the people through different tools, um, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, not only video conferences, not only the support of the experts, uh, uh, the remote experts on that, but also through different um, elements like uh, the, uh, the, the physical exercise, physical activities, the food intake, and also some other uh, 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 psychological, psychological supports uh, uh, to, to, to afford the, the challenges, you know? This is one of the fields in which I think that uh, 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 the, the telemedicine um, uh, had a big advance and will have in the future. But then in all the fields of the medical care, you know, mainly for chronic patients like uh, neurological, uh, cardiological uh, uh, patients or, or in, in, in any fields, uh, it, will, it will grow on the, on the facilities 
uh, for supporting all the people, even in terms of mobile health, mobile telemedicine. Let me know, let me tell uh, you not only at in, uh, as a home care, but also in all the uh, scenarios that uh, uh, the citizen is moving on. Thank you very much, Professor Pequia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let me thank again my friend Maria Teresa Redondo for the inspiring talk. Thank you, Maria Teresa. We really appreciate that. And now in the interest of time, if you agree, I would move to our next uh, panelist, which is Natalie Virag. Natalie is a scientist specialized in cardiovascular disease and computer modeling. She has a master in electronic engineer, uh, engineering and a PhD in digital signal processing. Um, Natalie leads the cardiovascular uh, research for part of the cardiovascular research program for Medtronic. So I would like to hear uh, Natalie's opinion about what you have been discussing so far. And in particular, if you could tell us what you think about the importance again of data in Europe. We know the data are strongly uh bounded to research which in europe is uh, is uh, we are leading in this space probably together with friends from the united states but also they are fundamental in order to uh, prepare the future intervention in terms of diagnosis and uh, therapy in this field if it is true in general this is particularly true for cardiovascular disease which is exactly your domain of expertise Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Leandro, and thank you, um, all the speakers. This is a very inspiring session. Um, I like the question you asked, and, and you know, I work for a medical device company, so we talked about devices. I think Adriana mentioned the importance of devices in, in, uh, in healthcare, and I think by having more devices, we can uh, basically move from away from treatment only to, to what uh, the vision that uh, Maria Teresa had just presented, which is also prediction, prevention, and moving away from only sick patients to also healthy patients and in a whole uh, kind of a whole more holistic approach to, to healthcare, not only looking at the patient who are sick. And the other thing we can also look at is comorbidities and try to address those. But right now, currently, I mean, as a scientist uh, in the company I work, we mostly have device data, but by having all these multiple sources of data coming, so either from wearables, devices, hospital data, and, and merging these together, we can really achieve this task. And uh, But the challenge will be, and as a scientist, I see it every day, while I can really control device data almost, for more devices at least, uh, having multiple sources of, of data is a challenge. So what was presented before on uh, standardization will be really critical uh, to develop new therapies. And also we'll have, I mean, therapies and prediction prevention. And we also work with different players including non-conventional players that will come in the game. And, and you mentioned telecommunication is one of them. Uh, the big tech uh, also is another, you know, they are trying to enter the game of healthcare and many people do. So, and this is maybe a challenge to the whole team here. How are we gonna handle those, all those challenges? And I know we have other speakers mentioning, you know, the patient point, the user interface point. And, but the last thing I wanna say in, in, at the end of this is really, the data will allow us to be patient specific. And I think this is very dear to my heart because uh, I think um, making it patient specific will make it safer, uh, will make it much better for the patient. And in the end, this is what we are aiming for is providing good solutions for patients and people. And I think this is a good transition to what we'll, we'll, we'll say after. I don't wanna go into this, but I, I really think it's important to put the patient in the center and this will be achieved by having more data. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your comments and uh, insightful uh, points to this discussion. Please stay with us for this panel, and then we intend to open the floor to uh, attendees. I see already there are a lot of good comments and questions in the chat. Allow me to invite attendees to put your question using the chat or the question and answer tool in this Zoom. Now I would leave the floor to Krishnan for continuing introducing our panelists, and then we can open a question and answer session with the uh, panelists. Uh, okay, thank, so you. thank you, thank you. I, I'm really glad that Dr. Virag, you know, from from industry is here. Actually, 
30 years ago, when somebody asked, what is biomedical engineering? I could think of pacemaker, you know, <laughs> that is easy for everybody to understand. So Medtronic has been doing a fantastic work, keep up the good work. And now, you know, talking about a pacemaker, we move to a heart, you know, I, that's the area of my research, cardiovascular systems. And here we have an expert, you know, Dr. Will Bowden, he's the CEO of Heartwell Voice since 2016. It's an organization that aims to address the underdiagnosis and undertreatment of people with heart valve disease. You know, because a lot of people talk about ECG and the electrical thing, but you know, there's mechanical aspects and heart valves are important, right? And uh, he has been mostly focused in the UK, he's the chair of the Heart Valve Disease Council for uh, Global Heart Hub. He's the founder of European Valve Disease Awareness Day. I know where to go if I need a heart valve. So let me hear your comments, uh, Dr. Wilbo. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll just point out I'm not a doctor. You would not want me to do a valve procedure on you. I promise you that. I've um, represented patients for a long while, but I've, uh, I'm not a patient or a doctor, but I've spent many years working um, in, in the valve disease space. And I think there are three key things that I would like to just get across in my kind of minute or two preamble of how... Um, we can get better access to biomedical engineering benefits of technology and, and therapies and, and how we can take those to influence some of the European health priorities, which we know cardiovascular disease across Europe affects millions. Um, and, and there are huge inequalities of accessing treatment. And those three things, I think, is about policy coordination. I think for, for many years, we've suffered quite a fragmented cardiovascular disease policy landscape. And while some countries have specific um, political and policy attention, that isn't necessarily the, the same across the whole of the European uh, ge geography. And, and specifically, na national cardiovascular disease strategies are lacking in many places. Here in the UK, for example, we still don't have a national cardiovascular strategy. Uh, that's something I'll be taking to Westminster next month, in fact. I have a whole host of patients and clinicians calling for that action because that will drive innovation. That will drive the appetite for biomedical engineering excellence. So we're, we're looking for that kind of policy coordination and particularly at Global Heart Hub. Um, we recently launched a report um, and influence clinical guidelines, which will be uh, hosted in the European Parliament next year, uh, next month. I think secondly, we should all be uh, incredibly pleased with the advancements in innovation and devices and therapies for valve disease, particularly over the past 15 to 20 years specifically. We've seen new diagnostics, intelligent stethoscopes, handheld echocardiography, which is enabling us to detect and diagnose quicker, more accurately. And it can be in the place where the patient needs it. And again, that spurs on that enthusiasm from patients to get more involved in their patient pathway and ask for more from our biomedical engineers and ask more from our policymakers. We've seen minimal invasive surgeries, transcatheter therapies, again, a patients wanting um, a, a quicker, a shorter treatments and quicker recoveries. And I think that the typical dynamics of how a patient access technology is shifting. And I think those kind of conservative led restrictions on new devices, the health economics and commissioning barriers. I see patients and clinicians now being much more sophisticated in demonstrating the wider implications of getting innovation into the hands of clinicians and physicians. Um, and, and, and why is that? My final comment, I guess, would be is that patients are collaborating and their thirst for knowledge is increasing, particularly in the cardiovascular spa vascular space. Um, Global Heart Hub's got some excellent examples about how partnerships between clinicians, technology providers and patients influence change. We see now regularly on internet forums, 60 year olds, 70 year olds, indeed 80 year olds asking questions about paravalvular leak rates and stroke risks based on all the products that they're available. 
patients are driving forward technology. We're a much more connected community now. Um, and that coordinated voice will drive forward technology. Patients want treatment earlier. They want it better and they want it more, I suppose. And we're much more sophisticated, as I said, about policy engagement, making sure that, um, you know, that as a partnership between these excellent biomedical um, people across Europe, policymakers, politicians, patients and industry, we can achieve great things. Well, uh, thank you very much. You know, cardiovascular heart disease, you know, look at WHO and they always say heart disease and cancer are number one and two all over the world. You know? So there's been a big focus even for biomedical engineers to study the cardiovascular systems. I mean, as a young student, I had a chance to listen to Dr. Christine Bernard, <laughs> and also I had a chance to listen to Dr. Michael DeBakey in Houston. You know, I mean, these are all, so many things have changed. I remember uh, printing a heart valve like uh, 18 years ago, and after it was 3D printed, I held in hand, it broke up. <laughs> but 3D printing has advanced so much today. You know? So research and innovation are extremely important. There are many breakthroughs which are done. So you explain things very well, and I'm glad you touched on TAVR, you know, transcatheter, aortic valve repair. This is an excellent example of engineers, biomedical engineers working with cardiac surgeons to come up with something where it improves the overall quality, uh, overall outcomes, and also reduces the cost, the length of stay in the hospital. So in your opinion, uh, can you comment on what are some of the other areas which do not get enough attention? And how do you think some more concrete problems of the heart well, patient can be addressed. You are an expert, so you can make some comments. <laughs> well, I think it's already been touched on about data. I think across Europe, data on heart valve disease specifically is sparse. Too many, uh, I think, patients receive their life-saving treatment too late. Um, and it's a combination of that low awareness levels, misdetection, opportunities, delays and in, in, in diagnosis. And, and actually, in terms of epidemiology on heart valve disease, the data is often out of date. Um, so there is a real need to cross Europe to centralize databases of, of that data. And I think that will, again, drive not only improvements in the patient pathway leading to outcomes and experience, but also making us be more aware of how technology um, can be used most appropriately, as you say, to reduce um, uh, to costs as well. I think the treatment choice is key. We need to put up um, the fact, as I mentioned, it will drive forward change with the fact that patients uh, are asking more about what treatment is available to me. Now, obviously I understand it clinically appropriate whether or not HAVR is available to, to certain patients, but actually, and I welcome ESC and EACS putting the patient at the center of making the treatment choice. And that's really, really important because that thirst for knowledge of patients to understand what innovative devices are available to them to give them that shorter stay or recovery will drive those forward. So putting more pressure on clinicians, I guess, to involve the patient. Early detection, as I've mentioned, is really driving innovation. The more we, the, there is a lot of the disease out there and we're only capturing a small amount of that. So we need to drive early detection to then um, provide uh, opportunities for more innovation to, 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 to be uh, presented to patients. And we need to tackle that through awareness raising campaigns. And then I suppose finally, someone else I mentioned again about research, we need to broaden the, the scope of research for cardiovascular disease, particularly in valve disease, I would argue, um, to include valve disease because it is one of the biggest killers across Europe. So broader, broader research, more awareness and earlier detection, giving patients choice and then having the data then to feed back into that, uh, into that kind of um, melting pot. That would be my areas of focus. Excellent. I think uh, getting patients engaged and getting them, you know, aware of things is really important. Patient engagement, I think, brings up the overall outcome much better. And uh, you covered these topics well. And you even said eight-year-old is asking you a question about the leak in the valve. Uh, as long as they don't ask you to solve Navier-Stokes equation or ask the Reynolds number of the blood flow around the valve, then you will be okay. 
I see Dr. Virag is smiling. So, Professor pass- Picky, uh, I pass it on to you. Yeah, I will pass ahead. it on to you as well. I will pass that yeah. question straight on to you, Doctor. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor Picky. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, uh, discussion and conversation. I was just keeping an eye on the time because we are running a bit late. But let's go very short to my question for uh, Umberto Nocco. Umberto, you have more than 20 years of experience as a clinical engineer, so really from the, from the front line, from the, from the hospital. And this has been a very difficult period for you and the clinical engineers all over Europe. So my question for you is how uh, COVID has been impacting on your work and uh, in, on hospitals in general from the perspective of technologies, but also how the European community of clinical engineers have been responding to this pandemic. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leandro. Thank you, Christian, for the invitation. It was great, great pleasure for us being here today and uh, uh, actually a great panel of speakers, very distinguished. So I'm really uh, I don't feel the odd one out, luckily, because uh, I still am a uh, biomedical engineer. Since clinical engineering is actually a, an operative branch of clinic of biomedical engineering, as you might say it. So um, uh, it, it's really being part of the business that makes us uh, helpful in, in all the uh, in all the equation. Um, the thing is to answer briefly to your question is we had really tough years. Uh, it's been it's been really hard in the past two years. We've been working day and night to provide devices, trying to figure figure out where we can find them, be, even before sending them to work inside the hospitals. So uh, it was a very tiring both for us, clinical engineering, uh, and for biomed to work with us every day and handle uh, all the devices. Um, to be truly honest. Uh, one of the things we had so far um, that we have to deal with in the near future is the fact that uh, we're getting more and more technology outside the hospital. Uh, as was stated before by someone else, um, we have follow-ups, we have telemedicine, we, have, uh, we are trying to keep the patient outside the hospital, which is not just a matter of uh, having place available for uh, let's say more uh, uh, in danger people, but also trying to keep healthcare uh, working a little bit more on patients because they may feel better if they stay at home or close to their place. So uh, this has a drawback on us, uh, clinical engineers and people who deal with uh, with technology, because both on the um, uh, on the design point of view, from the design point of view, and from our healthcare management point of view. You have to uh, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, you have to um, set up uh, devices that can be easily held by patients at their place and that can be easily maintained and uh, held by uh, uh, clinical engineering inside the hospital. We have to provide uh, all the maintenance and all the uh, technology management uh, throughout the entire life cycle. Um, more to that, of course, we need to have probably different vision and different uh, data available to to do some technology assessment as Adriana Velasquez was saying in the first place uh, HTA is something very important when you have to define which technology you want to provide to the patient and still on that on that uh, side of the business we we still have to acquire data because probably there's there's not too much available on all the devices that uh, can be given to patients and sent to the um, to their house and to their places. So it, it's more like a, of of working together. I mean, we're all biomedical engineers, so we have to we, we we need to try to work a little bit more together. Like on one side, uh, managers and uh, designers uh, that tend to see to the two sides from just one point of view at one time. So we need to just to get together and see with both eyes at the same time, like a 3D vision instead of a 2D vision, if you see what I mean. Um, what we went to so far in the past two years, uh, there was a great deal of work done by IFNBE and particularly the CED division of IFNBE in which uh, the association I'm president of is, is part of. And um, we Actually, we had the chance to get together, which was not so easy before COVID. I don't know why. Uh, we had 
a great experience in 2019 in Rome with the uh, uh, with the uh, International Congress of Clinical Engineers, uh, which was the last one in person. Unfortunately, this year we have the one uh, on uh, on webinar and uh, virtual uh, event. Um, but still, we have you have to figure out that throughout Europe there are more or less 30 national associations who collect uh, biomedical engineers. And among these, you may count up to 10 who are dedicated specific to clinical engineers. And uh, in the past two years, we had the chance to hook up together, to share expertise, and to uh, try to share uh, our information to what we've been doing so far. Um, one of the things that um, allows us to do that is that throughout Europe, we, say we share the same regulation. I mean, we have uh, medical device regulation and also uh, procurement regulation that are um, are the same, and this makes it easier, but still there are some differences. So we might need to enhance this common uh, going together of all the uh, biomedical and the clinical engineering uh, movement because, and, and the European community can help us do that because we need, still we need some more regulation on, on clinical engineering and biomedical engineering without uh, setting too many um, fences in which we can move in because one of the great things that we had so far as biomedical, I think, and clinical engineering is that we didn't have two fences, so we too many fences, so we could uh, broaden our view and move uh, throughout many spaces that help us increase our profession and um, our contribution to the, to the safety and to the healthcare, healthcare business. So. Um, what I would say in the end to, to end up my, my brief speech is that uh, we, we still need to work a lot more together and maybe provide uh, occasion and chances to get together in person now that we can, of course. Uh, although this uh, uh, mean that we're using today is really easy because we are uh, all, all the way through Europe and not only because, of course, there are people also from the other side of the ocean. And, and this is really... Uh, makes it really smooth for us to get together and share expertise, which is the most important thing for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Umberto. Thank you very much. It's uh, so inspiring and I completely agree with you. We are different faces of the same medal, clinical engineer, biomedical engineer, biomedical scientists. We are all on the same boat. Uh, and uh, and uh, all that said by you, the president of the Italian Society of Clinical Engineering, which is certainly the larger in Europe and probably one of the larger in the world. So this is particularly important. Thank you for that. Yeah, I agree on all your points. So let's work together because otherwise we cannot face those overwhelming, overwhelming challenges. Now, again, in the interest of time, I would give the floor to Lutz. Then I would welcome uh, Dr. Baller April from the WHO because I know she has an important meeting 335, which actually I should join. But then we can continue with the question and answer session. Okay. So if you don't mind, after Lutz, I would give the floor to April and then we can continue with the question and answer. Professor Krishna, back to you to introduce our friends Lutz. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, uh, for the invitation to this uh, amazing uh, event, Professor um, Krishnan and uh, Leandro uh, Pekia. Uh, my name is Lutz Peschka. I'm from the Department of Communication and Design in Ankara, in uh, Bilkent University in Ankara. And um, I have an, uh, a PhD degree in um, chemistry and in media studies. And therefore, my um, research topics and interest is especially um, uh, public engagement and public understanding of science. And um, in fact, I, um, uh, when uh, Will Rowan um, uh, talked about um, his, um, uh, the situation that the thirst of knowledge of the society increased a lot, this is exactly that with what I could, what we could um, understand in our project as well. And so I'm, um, I have the honor to be the coordinator of an Horizon project where Leandro and uh, Timo Yemze um, are also inside. Um, and um, in fact, um, we understood um, especially um, the thirst of knowledge in pandemic crisis increased. And this is one reason. So in fact, COVID-19 is not the first pandemic as we all know 
know, but it is the first pandemic um, since uh, the uh, internet became mobile. And therefore, the, um, uh, the thirst of knowledge, the information need increased a lot. And this caused a very big problem uh, because um, the, um, the public, and there are lots of studies which um, uh, confirm that, um, are afraid of um, fake news, of inaccurate news, but on the other side also, um, they do not know how to separate accurate news from the fake news. Now, therefore, the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we can easily understand as a media crisis. Now, and, um, but from, uh, from the perspective um, of the thirst of knowledge, I would like to go one step further. Now, when if we want to understand the role of Bio biomedical engineering to support the EU's health policy agenda and patients in Europe, and this is in fact our um, to the title of our panel, at that moment we have to understand the user and media perspective of knowledge transfer and innovation processes. And it means that we definitely, we urgently need to include the knowledge inside of the innovation processes. Now, it is not only the time is over where we can understand innovation processes as an, a collaboration between uh, science, economy, and um, politics. It is uh, now absolutely important and vital that we include the knowledge of the society as active partners as well. Now, and therefore, um, our understanding, this is what we want to find out is how can we do this, especially in pandemic crisis. Um, we create um, in, our, um, uh, in our project a knowledge platform and um, also an, a kind of contact tracing app. And this cause, of course, problems. The first of all, we are dealing with data. We have to deal with knowledge exchange. This is what um, uh, all the panelists and um, uh, keynote speakers already mentioned. And we have, first of all, to understand how can we make the data transfer accurate and in a legal um, uh, in, in, in a legal way um, uh, that, in fact, it does not cause problems in the context of data protection, privacy, and so on. And this is a very sensitive theme, and um, therefore, um, I'm really happy um, to co collaborate, especially with uh, Leandro and uh, Timo and my consortium in this um, um, uh, in this question and uh, interestingly um, it is today the half time of our projects and we have next week a meeting in Venice and collect all the data and um, let's see what's happened. Thank you very much. Thank you Lutz, thank you so very much. Before, I know Krishna has a couple of questions for you but before I would like, if you don't mind, to leave the floor to Dr. Baller April from the World Health Organization. Dr. Baller is the leader of IPC, which stands for Infection Prevention and Control at the World Health Emergency Program. And to be honest, if you are a leader of one unit to the World Health Emergency, while during a pandemic it starts a war, then I must say your life becomes very busy. So really let me thank you, April, for uh, uh, taking some time to join us. I would pass no more time with my useless word. I would leave you to bring your comments on this panel and then I know you have to fly. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Leandro, for those uh, warm words of welcome. And um, thanks so much for this, this opportunity. Um, I've been listening in, not for the whole session, but for part of it. And uh, just to say, it's really interesting. Also great to see some of the, uh, the comments uh, that's in the chat as well. So really just want to thank the speakers, the panelists and, and MEP, uh, Tomislav Sokol. Sokol, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly for hosting this event. Uh, and I think some of the takeaways really is the highlighting the importance of the good cooperation between experts. I've heard of many different types of experts today, the clinical engineers, the biomedical engineers, all of these experts, but particularly how they work together with policymakers. Uh, because of course, we really need this joint action to have any real impact on the health systems and to make uh, to make 
the changes and, and the light of all of the challenges. Uh, it is very important that all of the voices of the experts, the researchers and innovators are heard at policy level uh, to make sure that the cost effective health technologies that have been spoken of today, including medical devices, personal protective equipment, which is the area that IPC focuses on and the digital health solutions can quickly reach those most needed. The very interesting discussions I heard on the on the telemedicine and, and really adapting to the situation today. So it's critical that all of these things are highlighted, but they're also brought to the next level up. And to make sure that for this to happen, that the European uh, policies are maximally aligned with what the citizens need, uh, steering research and innovation actions in this space. So just a, as a reflection of the many, many lessons that have been learned from COVID and looking towards the future, there's just key, two key points that we wanted to highlight. One is the vital uh, importance of the international cooperation, that none of this can be done alone. We know that we're all in this together. Um, and that has been shown uh, particularly on the, on the issue of vaccination coverage globally, and also being able to develop those vaccines. Um, and one of the elements as well that's been particularly interesting has been to reflect on how prepared the different countries have been, and particularly within the context of, of, of Europe, there has been an expectation that really countries would be more prepared than they have. Um, and I think this is something for all of us to, just to, to really reflect on and, and that some of the discussions today also speak to that. Um, and in light of this, in the last few decades, the European policies have been focusing mostly on supporting innovation in the field of advanced health technologies. And this leaves some of the more cost-effective low-hanging technologies or the, the, the low-hanging fruits, that was, as we say, as personal protective uh, equipment and also the promotion of infection prevention and control interventions such as alcohol-based hand rub, they have been left behind. So it's really important that all of this is looked at uh, in, in, in this light. As far as WHO, WHO has taken steps to prepare for, for future pandemics. And one of the key areas has been uh, the development of the research and development uh, blueprint uh, forum and agenda for COVID-19. This was started back in February 2020. Within that, uh, there was a lot of research priorities that were identified. And this has been uh, uh, basically followed up with over 100 different research projects that have been implemented. Uh, and as the pandemic has evolved, the, the group has come together again to review what are the priorities moving forward. And the last meeting was held in March and there has been a uh, report that has been uh, published. And I will ask Leandro kindly to share that with everyone. And here you can read about what are some of these research priorities that are also relevant to the discussions today uh, moving forward. And we really hope that the agenda that's being highlighted there will align with the European institutions and the international organizations organizations um, to ensure that we move forward in this domain and be better prepared. So with that, Leandro, thank you for this opportunity and back to you. You are muted. Okay. You are muted. Thank yeah. you, Evelyn. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I will share the link to this document and to the wider page of the Blueprint program because it is important that uh, all our community as a researcher and practitioner familiarize with the work that the World Health Organization have been doing probably for the first time with this intensity in the domain of research and innovation. Once again, thank you, Evelyn, for that. Uh, Sorry to be late, but I know you have to leave now. So if there is any urgent question, I will be happy to, to bring those to April after this meeting. Sorry for the interruption. So uh, Professor Krishnan, back to you, the floor. I know you had a couple of questions for uh, Lutz, and then well, we can I, continue I, with the question and answer session. Yeah, thanks a lot. I also like to thank Dr. Baller for, you know, being present. I know she's been extremely busy. Uh, I want to convey to you on behalf of the International Federation of uh, Medical and Biological Engineering, we, we, uh, we value your work, we respect your work, we work closely with WHO, and it is really important you are doing for the whole world. And uh, you, know, you brought up some good points with uh, respect to research and innovation. And you know, of all the panelists, I think this is our 
uh, goal. This is our commitment. You know, we do this all along, but uh, uh, at the leadership role, uh, the policies you are doing and the initiatives you are taking and uh, supporting this whole uh, healthcare field is uh, commendable. So please continue your work. We, we support you and we wish you all the best because it is for us, you are working anyway, it's for all of us. So all the best to you. Thank you very much for taking the time out and we wish you the best. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we continue uh, with uh, uh, our good friend, uh, Lutz. Before I go, I want to say to our friend, uh, uh, the president of Italian Biomedical Society, Mr. Umberto, you know, uh, I work in large universities, you know, every time they say, who is CE? I say clinical engineer. They say, no, it's civil engineer. I say clinical engineer, you know, because <laughs> CE is clinical engineer to us. When we go to the hospital, I worked at Harvard Hospital, Mass General and other large hospitals. Clinical engineers are really important. When things don't work, they, when things have to work, the health technology assessment, clinical engineering is extremely important, you know. Just imagine a hospital without clinical engineer, it cannot work. So we are very important. Now we come to another very important person in charge of communication, you know. I, I could probably say of all the people in the panel, the only person who may get a Nobel Prize is Dr. Pesky because he has a PhD in chemistry, you know. Most of us have degrees in engineering. Is that correct, Dr. Virag? You know, there is no Nobel Prize for uh, engineering. So you have the only chance and you are an expert in communication, you know, in graduate program that I design, you know, all the experts keep emphasizing the importance of communication, you know, your school of communication and design. So communication is really, really important, you know, and then there has been a great problems with this data, you know, the data and particularly with the pandemic, you know, there, we need to really take uh, good care of communicating properly and what is the perception of common citizen, okay? So uh, I guess you, you have been involved also on the projects like European Health Data Space, okay? So please, yeah. uh, uh, I would, on the behalf of the audience, like to hear your comments on uh, how do we handle with this uh, yeah. difficult part of communication? You you even brought this interesting fake news and things like that. But yeah, yeah. how do we yeah, do yeah. the good news? How do we do uh, convey yes. things? To, so people have confidence in what they are listening and they can exactly. follow them. And this is, in fact, uh, indeed a very relevant um, question. Um, um, first of all, our uh, Pandavita project is um, especially um, dealing with a question, with a very, very complex question of voluntariness. And because at that moment, when we include um, uh, the public, the media-based and culture-based public into the process of knowledge circul circulation in order um, uh, to develop um, sustainable innovations. Um, at that moment, we can do, do this only in an ethical way when, we, when, the, um, when the society, when the citizens do proceed this in a voluntary way. And this is especially, so we, are, um, we analyzed a lot of um, uh, um, COVID-19 uh, tracking applications, um, um, especially in you know, so where um, yeah, less or more, we have to say less or more, um, uh, the people, the citizens are involved in data collection in a voluntary way. Uh, we know in, um, in uh, Europe, there, is, there are high ethical standards, especially in anonymizing the data, in, um, in the voluntary, um, voluntariness of uh, using the uh, contact tracing apps um, and so on. But there are other countries and um, uh, where at least the understanding of voluntariness is different. And Turkey um, is one of the, um, the examples. So we have there um, an, a different approach to uh, apply to um, a public um, life, like going to the university campus, uh, going in a shopping mall. Shopping mall, it means that we need to um, have a kind of uh, so-called HES code, which in fact 
um, gives the data directly uh, to a central um, uh, uh, a database of the health ministry. And um, this is um, uh, from the point of view from the um, from the media right um, in Turkey. Okay, now, since they say this is in fact the safe database um, and um, nobody outside uh, get these kind of data, but in fact this is not not um, uh, it is not voluntary and we do not know um, so as a citizen citizens do not have um, uh, the the, the uh, choice to understand what is what will happen with these data and this is a very big problem in uh, in the um, process of um, uh, knowledge communication since knowledge communication is based on data now and these kind of issues we can find and uh, this is what i hope that um, we have somehow an, a pilot project which where we can apply certain or solve certain problems um, which we can use in other um, processes um, uh, knowledge communication communication processes as well. You know, excellent, thank you. You know, there is a lot of uh, efforts with in, including artificial intelligence, data mining. Exactly. And then, you know, this has become really important and uh, engineers, you know, necessarily do not have any courses on communication. <laughs> they need to learn to communicate best. You know, that is the way uh, everything, communication is, you know, uh, extremely important. and. Uh, understanding by patients, you know, I think we have also patient experts on the panel, they brought up the topic. So, uh, you know, I, I do not know, Professor Pickia, how much time we have because we are, I think, running slightly behind schedule. So if, if it is okay, you know, I, I would like to, uh, on my personal behalf, also as the president of International Federation of Medical and Biological Engineering, uh, express my sincere thanks and gratitude for uh, inviting me continuously to take part in the European Parliament uh, special interest group sessions. I think uh, Professor Pickia deserves a great uh, amount of credit for his initiative. You know, uh, I think he doesn't sleep at all. You know, he's trying to go back and forth. Uh, but uh, fantastic work, uh, and all the panelists have done great work. I think we I will pass it back to you, Professor Pekia. And once again, thanks to uh, all. And if I'm allowed, it is right from uh, Professor, the distinguished uh, member of the Parliament. You know, Dr. Sokol and everybody else, as well as uh, uh, yes. Uh, Lubna and our Dr. Kaliroy and uh, Dr. Anton, everybody, you know, uh, fantastic support work, you know, to make it really interesting and educational for all of you. Professor Pekia, back to you, please.